Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Saturday, February 3rd slate of college basketball DFS, but we're going to do a little bit of a different format this week. So there's a lot of shows out there that are going to go game by game and just break down everything there is to know on the main slate. So what we're going to do here on this episode is we are going to hit up all three slates, but we're going to do it slightly differently. So that way I'm not here like literally all of mine. So what we're going to do is I'm going to look at each slate, the main slate that starts at noon Eastern time, the afternoon slate that starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and then the night slate that starts at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm going to look at from each slate a game that you need to be targeting and I think is the best environment to game stack. And then we're going to look at the guard position and the forward position and highlight a play from the top tier, mid tier, and low tier of pricing. So if you listen to this, you should have just a full overview, full rundown of all three slates for this Saturday. Because as I mentioned before to you know the Discord and the Patreon, as well as on here, Saturdays are a marathon in college basketball DFS with all these three slates. So hopefully by doing it this way, we're going to make it a little more digestible and give you guys not only something for the main slate that you can use, but some information that's going to help you win on the afternoon as well as the night slate, because guess what? There's contests with pretty big prize pools out there for those slates too. So I don't think those slates need to be just ignored. So please let me know what you think of the format. Like if you like the format or not, let me know, reach out in the comments. Um, And if you do like the format, please hit the like button. Um, Hitting the like button in general helps me out a ton. And I really do appreciate it. It helps the videos get noticed um, and it does help out a lot. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. That way you can be notified when all of our videos drop for the rest of college basketball season all the way through March Madness. And you can get the rest of our weekly golf content as well. All right, so that does it for the introduction. You know, the whole point of doing this was to, you know, make it go a little quicker instead of having to do full, you know, 12 game breakdowns. So um, I don't want to, you know, beleaguer the introduction a little bit. So let's go ahead and end the introduction right there and let's go ahead and kick it off with our discussion of the main slate. All right, so the main slate on Saturday on DraftKings is going to be the one that tips off at 12 p.m. Eastern time, and this is the slate with the biggest prize pools of the day. They even have a $1 mini-max, which I'm actually kind of looking forward to, looking forward to playing in that one. So um, on this slate, there is 12 games, and obviously you can't play every single game, right? So what is the one game out there that I think you need to be getting some exposure to and and end up stacking? And I think there's a lot of choices. You know, um, UConn St. John's is intriguing. Virginia Tech Miami is intriguing. But the game that I went with at the end of the day was Texas taking on TCU. Am I a little bit of a homer for picking this one? Maybe because they are my Texas Longhorns, but also they do have the highest total of the slate according to Ken Palm. Ken Palm has this game projected to finish 79 to 74 in favor of TCU. Um, so that's a 153 point total, which does rank as the highest on the slate. Now, also, not only are there going to be a lot of points scored in this game, but there's a lot of fantasy points scored in this game, or at least I think there's going to be because TCU gives up the 310th best assist rate in the nation. So what that means is, generally speaking, when they're giving up baskets, they're almost always assisted on. And what that means for us in fantasy is not only is somebody on Texas getting two or three points for the basket, but somebody on Texas is also going to get 1.5 points for the assist. And TCU is also playing at the 62nd best tempo in the nation. So this is a big time pace up spot for the Longhorns. Now, what we also saw with, you know, from the TCU perspective is we just saw a high usage guard in Pop Isaac go off for 40 plus fantasy points against them. So to me, that opens up a window where Max A. Smith, knowing that he has a pretty high assist rate, knowing that TCU gives up a pretty high assist rate, and knowing that he generally has a pretty high usage rate, I think this really shapes up for Max A. Smith with a big ceiling potential game. And what you saw if you watched the Houston game Monday night, which Man, by the way, this Big 12 schedule is a gauntlet. Like every game in the Big 12 feels like it could be a season altering win if you're able to win it. If you're a team like Texas that's on the NCAA tournament bubble, you know, you win some of these games, you're going to end up in the field and you're going to have plenty of opportunities to win games like this. It's just crazy how good that conference is. But anyway, if you watch the Houston game, Max Asmus in a close game had the ball in his hands a lot. He ended up taking 15 shots, ended up making six of them, which I guess that Houston defense is not terrible. So I definitely think Asmus is going to have it a lot. And the way TCU gives up fancy points, I think this could be a big spot for him. And Dylan DeSue is a guy that I'm going to play on almost every slate he's on. Because if I'm being honest, the only guy that can keep Dylan DeSue 
under 4X is Dylan DeSue getting in foul trouble. And if he would just stay out of foul trouble, just don't foul, he, and he stays out on the floor a lot, he's going to put up 30 30 plus fantasy points. You know, if you're looking, well, Mike, he only put up 28 against Houston. Well, yeah, he did have four fouls down the stretch of that game, and that is Houston. That's the best defensive team in the nation, according to Ken Pop. So TCU is a much better matchup, and I think Dylan DeSue has a legitimate 50 fantasy point ceiling, which he has gotten multiple times this year. And then Kendall Weaver is a value play that I think you can get on the Texas side. He is seeing his minutes increase. He's played 25 minutes in the last three games. Against Houston, he only took four shots, but he was out on the floor in crunch time when it mattered guarding Houston. Houston's best player, and I expect it to be the same way here against TCU, and his price tag did not jump a whole lot at all. And another thing I like about targeting this Texas team is that they're very, what's the word I'm looking for? They're predictably unpredictable. Here's what I mean. If there were ever a situation where Ace Miss or DeSue doesn't get there, Dylan Mitchell or Tyrese Hunter is going to get there. You know, in that Houston game, we mentioned DeSue only put up 28 fantasy points, which is not bad. You know, in that game, Dylan Mitchell had 31.5, which is really good for a guy at his price tag. You know, we've seen Max Acemas not get there in games. Well, when Acemas isn't getting there, it generally means Tyrese Hunter is getting more peripheral stats, and Tyrese Hunter has a chance to get there as well. Look at the BYU game where Tyrese Hunter outscored Max Acemas in fantasy points. So I think this Texas team is really easy to target against the TCU defense that gives up a lot of fantasy points. And on the TCU side, Texas's biggest defensive weakness is at the guard spot. And TCU has some guards, especially bigger guards, that can fill it up, like Micah Peavy, who plays a ton of minutes. He's gotten double-digit shots in the last three games, and he's gotten over 25 fantasy points in the last four games. I think he's a pretty solid option um, going against this Texas defense. I really like Travion Tennyson, though. He's a transfer from um, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. He's had over 30 fantasy points in back-to-back -back games. He has taken over this starting point guard role and hasn't played fewer than 28 minutes in the last five games, and he's priced at only $6,200. That's a very reasonable price tag for Travion Tennyson against this Texas team that we've seen give up a ton of fantasy points to the guard spot. All right, so that is the game that I would be targeting. Now let's go ahead and go position by position. So I'm going to give a high, mid, and low tier price for both the guard and the forward spots on this slate. So at the guard spot, we're going to define the top tier as 7K and above, mid tier 5K to 7K, and then um, low tier is going to be under 5K. So at the top tier, one thing to keep in mind when building your lineups this week and really going forward in college basketball season is it is rematch season. So there's a lot of guys who have played games against the team that they're going up against in, in their next matchup, and they've had success against them, right? And so you can go to guys like that. You know, an example would be like Sean Padua of Virginia Tech, who had 54 fancy points against Miami the first time they played. But the guy that I like for that reason is Tyler Kolick. So Tyler Kolick of Marquette, he's one of the best floor generals in the country, first off. But in the first game against Georgetown, which was a 30-point blowout, by the way, Tyler Kolick still played 30 minutes, still took 11 shots, still put up 40.25 fantasy points. That'll get the job done. And in this one, there's even reason to think that he might see more fantasy points because what if the game's a little closer and he plays a few more minutes? You know, that would instantly be another 5, 10 fantasy points. But also, Cam Jones, his backcourt mate, is very questionable for this game. I would say, I don't, I'm not a medical guy, but I would say it's more likely than not that Cam Jones does not play in this game. And in the last game that Cam Jones did not play against Villanova, Tyler Kolick played 38 minutes, put up 20 shots, um, put up 60 total fantasy points. He had 32, 6, and 9 in a game where he had a 35% usage rate, which is his high on the season, and his season high in fantasy points too with that 60.5 total. So uh, just a dream spot for Tyler Kolick with the matchup and with his potential backcourt mate being out. He has legitimate 60 to 65 fantasy point upside. Now in the mid-tier, you know, injuries are going to happen as well. There's a lot of guys on this slate that are questionable that could open up some value, like Kanye Clary and Matthew Cleveland, which would open up the door to me playing Keyshawn George of Miami. It would also open up the door to me playing um, Damian Dunn on Penn State if, um, you know, Kanye Clary is out again. Dunn filled in quite admirably um, in the last game, ended up put up 32.75 fantasy points against Rutgers. Ace Baldwin would also be a top tier option that would be in play if uh, Kanye Clary does end up mentioning. But I want to, you know, talk about a guy who is not dependent on an injury. Well, 
Kind of, sort of. What I mean by that is I'm going to talk about John Michael Wright of Oklahoma State. So he is kind of dependent on an injury, but, like, it's not a questionable injury. So Oklahoma State, one of their best players, Bryce Thompson, is now out for the season, and he has a 25.6% shot rate, the 24% usage rate. So there's going to be a lot of usage to go around in this Oklahoma State backcourt, and I think a lot of it could go to John Michael Wright. In their last game against Kansas, he played 34 minutes, he put up 13 shots, and he put up 21.5 fantasy points, which is not great, but we'll take it for a guy his salary $5,300. And he only was four for 13 from the field. So like, you know, what if he just happens to go seven for 13? That's an instant, you know, at least six or seven more fancy points right there. So I think John Michael Wright is the natural guy to fill in for that usage of Bryce Thompson. And I think he has a very good shot to um, exceed value here in this game. Next up, the low tier. Got to go beneath 5k this time, y'all. So um, you could use an Arkansas guy if you have any trust in Eric Musselman, um, like Keon Menefield Jr. Um, or Layden Blocker. The, but those guys had a lot of success in their last game. But this Arkansas team right now, who, buddy? Um, yeah, I just think that's a situation you can avoid. But I do think that Blocker and um, Blocker and Menefield do have some upside if you want to play them in a GPP. Um, but the guy that I like um, in the low tier is going to be a little bit contingent on an injury. It is going to be Anthony Liao of Indiana, um, and I really like him if Xavier Johnson is out. So Xavier Johnson did leave the Iowa game just a little bit early um, and played, you know, in that game, Anthony Liao played 21 minutes, put up 26 fantasy points in those 21 minutes, which is pretty impressive. He also played 16 minutes the game before against Illinois. So I do think that Liao is going to be worked into this rotation, even if Xavier Johnson does end up playing. But at only $3,700, he doesn't have to do a whole lot to hit value. And like I said, I really like him if Johnson is out. But I think that like you can set him in your lineups, you know, Friday night or early Saturday morning. And even if Johnson is in, I do think there's a chance he can give you value just because he is seeing his minutes increase and he is at that low price tag. All right, now let's go ahead and switch on over to the forward position. So we're going to do the same thing, high, mid, and low priced option at the forward spot. And high priced forwards on this main slate, like, it's a lot of pretty good options, right? Like Norchad Omir against Virginia Tech's got a lot of upside. You know, Joel Soriano taking on UConn. We saw Joel Soriano's ceiling game on Wednesday night. You know, Oso Iguodaro has been great. Kella Ware was great without Malik Renu in their last game. But my favorite high-priced forward play is going to be Jaden Ledee. So this guy has a legitimate 60 fantasy point ceiling. He did hit 60 earlier in the season, 64 to be exact, against Washington. And he's a rare big man who averages 33 minutes a game. Like he plays a a lot of minutes he's going to be out there on the floor and he has 29 percent usage rate on the season that's been a little bit lower in conference play but i really think utah state is a good matchup utah state does not play a big lineup and they can be bullied down low in their last game they played boise state and they gave up a combined 44 points to tyson dagenhart and omar stanley so i think this is a situation where Jaden ladee can really have a ceiling game against this small Utah State team. And, and I think that he is my favorite high price forward play at the slate. And I hope that because his game log lately hasn't been all that great, I hope a lot of people stay away. And there's a whole lot of other great options. So like if the ownership on Jaden Lindy's low, he could end up being one of the plays of the day. Now in the mid tier, under 7K, to me, this one is pretty darn simple. You've got two guys that I want to go out of my way to mention. First is Donovan Klingon. $6,700, not playing his full minute load yet, but if he does, he could absolutely smash. Just a guy to keep your eye out for. But the guy that's my official play in the mid-tier is going to be Mikel Mitchell of Arkansas. Yes, I just said earlier that I don't trust Arkansas, but I trust Mikel Mitchell. And the reason why is the last two games that Trayvon Brazil has missed, Mitchell has played over 30 minutes. He's played very well. He's put up double doubles in both those games, and he's put up 40 fantasy points in both of those games. And look, as much as I don't trust Eric Musselman, if Trevon Brazil is out, there's only so many big guys he can play. Mitchell's one of them, and Mitchell has proven to be pretty good in these last two games. I think he is a guy that I'm going to be playing a lot of in the mid-tier. Now in the low tier, um, we're going to have to get a guy that's a little bit injury dependent because there's just not a whole lot of great on-paper plays in the low tier. Like to me, Nick Martinelli of Northwestern isn't bad. Tier Award of LSU isn't bad, but like we don't want 
you know, not bad. We want a guy who can end up smashing, right? And a guy who could do that could be Anthony Walker. He played a lot of minutes filling in for Malik Renew last game for Indiana. And if Renew does end up missing this game, you're going to see probably 30 plus minutes from Walker. And in the last two games, he's played 31 and 26 minutes, put up 17 and 16 fantasy points. In this matchup against Penn State, Penn State can give up a lot of fantasy points to bigs. So I definitely think this is a solid spot for Anthony Walker, and he could smash at that price tag of $4,400. All right, that does it for the main slate. So let's take a quick breather and then let's transition on over to the afternoon. All right, so we have another 12-game slate in the afternoon, but there are a few games that stand well above the rest in terms of their stackability. Um, I do like a lot of the pieces in the Georgia Tech and NC State game. We're going to talk a little bit about that one. Um, I do like a lot of the pieces in the Duke-North Carolina game as well. That one's always a fun one to stack. But the game that I think is the premier game stack on this afternoon slate is Florida heading to College Station to take on Texas A&M. This one has the highest total of the slate, according to Ken Palm. Um, Ken Palm has this one projected to finish 78. 76 in favor of the Aggies. Now, what's really interesting about this one is these are the two teams who have the two best offensive rebounding rates in the nation. So the best offense in this game might just be a missed shot and one of these guys putting it back up and going to get it, right? Now, there's also going to be a lot of possessions in this game. Florida tends to play these high scoring shootout type of games. They rank 12th in the nation in tempo and their last three games have all seen a total of 149 points or higher. So it seems unlikely that Florida is going to be a team that's going to slow this game down and that this game is not going to get to 150 points. Now, for Florida, they have a lot of guys who have been having a lot of success lately, but the guy that does it in the most sustainable way to me is Zion Pullen. He has a 25% assist rate. He generally gets like between like 10 to 14 shots a game. Um, and he actually generally shoots it pretty well as well. Um, so he's a guy that I just, I, I think that what he's doing is sustainable. He's got a solid floor and a solid ceiling. And in a game environment like this one, he can really shoot out like it has each of the last two games for Florida where he's put up over 42 fantasy points in both of those games. Now, Tyree Samuel and Micah Hanlockton both have insane ceilings. Um, like for real, for real, insane ceiling. So Tyree Samuel had 51 fancy points against Kentucky on Wednesday night. He also has other, you know, 40 plus fancy point performances. And when he does that, it's generally because he gets a double double and scores a lot of points with it as well. Han Lawton is the same way, but he does it on different days that Samuel does. They generally never both get there together. Um, you know, it was Tyree Samuel had the big game against Kentucky. It was Han Lawton who had the big game against Georgia, 46.75 fancy points in that one. So both those guys with their ceilings. I think you can play one of them, but I certainly wouldn't play both of them together. But then you look at the other Florida guys like Clayton Jr. isn't the productive player that he was at the start of the season. Will Richard is a boomer bust guy. Alex Condon is a boomer bust guy. So like, I really think you can rely on pulling and then one of Samuel or Hanlockton if you're looking to stack up the Florida side. Now for Texas A&M, Tyrese Radford has an interesting legal situation going on. I don't know what his status is for this game. I really don't, and I'm not going to speculate on it, but I, what I will say is this. The last game that Tyrese Samuel, or not, not Tyrese Samuel, the last game that Tyrese Radford missed, it was against Houston. It, um, well, the last power conference game that he missed. There was another game in there that they played some no-name school that they ended up blowing out, but um, the last power conference game that Tyrese Radford missed was against Houston, and in that game, Wade Taylor had over a 40% usage rate. Now, it turned into 51.5 fantasy points against Houston, so what could that do against um, you know, a team like Florida that's going to get up and down, that's going to see a lot of possessions. We've seen games this year, like against Arkansas, where Wade Taylor took 32 shots in the game. Like if Radford is out, especially, he's going to have to take even more. So I think Taylor has a massive ceiling and a very high floor as well. And I really think he's one of the best plays this slate, and he makes for a perfect game stacking option. Now, Jace Carter is a name that would benefit big time if um, Radford were out, but he's been playing well lately. He's taken over a spot in the starting lineup for Hayden Hefner. He started the last three games. In those games, he's put up over 25 fantasy points in two of the three of them. So um, I do think Jace Carter is a really solid option. He's a really good rebounding guard. Tyrese Radford is also a really good rebounding guard. So you got to figure like some of those rebounds are going to go Jace Carter's way if Radford is out. And at $5,700, he's a really solid play. For the bigs for Texas a and 
him, you never really know what you're going to get. But Anderson Garcia coming off the bench has been the most consistent one that they've had all season. Um, he has actually shown a pretty high floor over the last six games. He hasn't scored fewer than 23 fantasy points in a game. But he doesn't do it by taking a whole lot of shots. He is really rebound dependent. But I like the fact that, you know, if he is rebound dependent, this is a game where he can get a lot of rebounds because Florida is going to push the pace and have us, you know, play more possessions in this game. So I think he's a pretty solid option as well. There's just an abundance of options from this game that you can go with. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the guard position. So my top tier option at the guard spot is going to be Jamal Shedd of Houston. And what I think we've seen from Houston now is we've seen them play enough close games now that when a game is close and it's tight and you need somebody to generate some offense, it's going to be Jamal Shedd. And look at their last two close games for evidence of that. Against BYU, he took 19 shots, put up 28 fantasy points. Not great, but he didn't shoot the ball all that well. And BYU is not exactly a team that just, you know, doles out fantasy points. Against Texas, he played 42 minutes, took 24 shots, put up 42.5 fantasy points in a game that he fouled out of in overtime. So I really do like Jamal Shedd. I think that if this is a close game against Kansas, which on paper it should be, then he should be an elite option because in a close game, he is going to have the ball in his hands. He's going to be asked to generate offense for this Houston team. Now in the mid-tier, Look, there's a lot of solid options on this slate. There really is. Um, you know, I almost shouted out DJ Horn of NC State as my high high tier or top tier option. Um, but as we go down to the mid tier, um, a guy that I like a lot just on paper is Doug McDaniel of Michigan. However, the matchup against Rutgers is certainly not enviable. So let's go a guy with, that has a good matchup, and that's going to be Ishmael Leggett of Pitt. So he appears to now be fully back from his injury. And if you remember back at the start of the season, Ishmael Leggett was a guy that was in the 8K range on DraftKings quite regularly. You know, but he missed some time with an injury, and he wasn't really all the way back. But I think his last two games signal that he's back. He's taken 12 and 16 shots in those two games, um, and he shot the ball decent in both those two games and he's put up 39 and 30 fantasy points in those two games so I really think he's all the way back he's back to being the player he was at the third season when he was about 8k and you're getting him at a price of you know 6900 and he's going up against a Notre Dame team that is just simply not that good and Pitt should be able to win this one quite easily they should be able to put up plenty of statistics along the way so Ishmael Leggett is my mid-tier play now also um we're going to mention this later um as well when we get to the low tier. But Kevin McCuller is questionable for this game for Kansas. I don't know what his status exactly is going to be. A guy that you can consider in the mid-tier would be Johnny Furphy, um, who has played incredibly well since entering the starting lineup. And, you know, it was not a close game against Oklahoma State, but you got to feel like in a close game, he's going to see a little bit more usage and a little bit more opportunity to put up fancy points. So he's a guy that I would consider. Um, I also mentioned that the Georgia Tech and NC State game has a lot of guys that I think you can consider. Um, Nathan George of Georgia Tech is an interesting one. Miles Kelly of Georgia Tech would be an interesting one. Jaden Taylor of NC State is in this mid-tier as well. Um, but as we get down to the low tier, the guy that I like in the low tier is going to be Nick Timberlake of Kansas. So um, last game against Kansas um, – or I'm sorry, last game against Oklahoma State, it was El Marco Jackson that got the start, but it was Nick Timberlake who played more minutes and, and put up more fantasy points. He put up 21.5 fantasy points in that game against Oklahoma State. Um, so, you know, I just think he had a higher usage rate than El Marco Jackson did. And if McCulver is out, you, you're going to see Timberlake continue to be that, you know, high usage player. He was a really high usage player at his last school, and he just hasn't been that at Kansas. But the game against Oklahoma State showed us some hope that he can be that if Kevin McCullough is out. So he would be a guy that I would have to have in my lineups if that is the case. Now, if that is not the case, um, because there's a good possibility that it's not, another guy that I would consider is Gavin Griffiths of Rutgers. First off, Michigan, in terms of like Big Ten teams, is a really solid matchup because they played a decent tempo and they're not good defensively. But Griffiths, the last two games, has taken on more of a role. He's put up 11 and 9 shots in those two games, played 18 and 24 minutes, put up 11 and 15 fantasy points, which might not sound like a whole lot, but he's only got a salary of $3,300. So if he puts up 15, you're going to be quite happy with that at the end of the day. 
All right, now let's take a look at the forward spot. So um, the top tier for the forward spot has a lot of guys who have been playing pretty well lately, like Janai Broom, like Harrison Ingram of North Carolina, like Brandon Carlson of Utah. But the guy that I'm going to pick for my high price forward spot is going to be Julian Reese of Maryland. They are taking on Michigan State, and they've already played each other this season. In that first game, Julian Reese had 36 fantasy points against Michigan State, which for a salary of $8,300, like we'll take that, right? But when you look deeper, you realize that that might actually have been like a floor game for Julian Reese. He had 21% usage in that game, which is lower than a season average. There was only 120 total points scored in that game, which is incredibly low. And he played 33 minutes in that game, which is pretty good. But also he wasn't in foul trouble at all. So like, I don't think he'll be in foul trouble in this one either. And so I definitely think that there's a chance that as long as he stays out of foul trouble, he puts up another double and it very easily crosses 40 fancy points against this Michigan State team. Next up, let's talk about the mid-tier. So there are a few injury-dependent plays in the mid-tier. Um, you know, Georgia Tech, you know, Bay Nadongo might be out for this game, and he's been one of their best players over the course of the season. So a guy that you could go with to replace him um, would be Tajon Claude. He's a guy that I like a whole lot if, in fact, um, Bay Nadongo does end up missing this game. Last game against North Carolina, Claude played 28 minutes, put up 24.5 fantasy points. And then um, – UCF is currently dealing with an injury to C.J. Walker, and Marcellus Avery would be a guy who would see boosted minutes. Last two games, he's put up 34 and 24 fantasy points in Walker's absence, so he's a guy that I would consider as well if we get news on C.J. Walker. So if you want a guy that's non-injury dependent, though, I'm going to talk about DJ Burns of NC State, and I got to find him here on DraftKings. There he is because he is at a low price tag. He's like the lowest I have seen him at like pretty much the last two years he's been at NC State. And he's priced at $6,000 right now, and I think he can easily hit that. Last game against Miami, Burns only played 13 minutes. But when he was out there, he had a 36% usage rate. So it's not the fact that he's not getting used. It's not the fact that he's not a part of the offense. It's the fact that he just didn't play a whole lot of minutes in that game. And it was really because he got in foul trouble early against um, Norchad Omir. And I don't see that happening against Georgia Tech, but their big situation being in flux without Nadongo. And in fact, if they don't have Nadongo, they're a really soft defense on the inside to opposing centers. And so I think Burns could take advantage of that. And, you know, if he does play more than, you know, 20 minutes and he sees that same usage rate, then he could have a very, very successful game against the George Tech front court. Now, the low tier. So I'm going to mention another guy. If um, Bay Nadongo is injured, then uh, Tafara Gapare of Georgia Tech um, becomes in play as well. He's $3,900 on DraftKings. He played a lot of boosted minutes in that game against North Carolina, played 25 minutes, put up 25 fantasy points. So if uh, Nadongo is out. It opens up a whole lot of value on the George Tech side, and I think it makes DJ Burns more appealing as well. So that's going to be an injury that you really got to monitor for this afternoon slate. But the guy that I'm going to target here in this low slate is going to be Fusaini Traore of BYU. Um, so he played 18 minutes against Texas, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's his most since returning from injury, like since Thanksgiving. Um, and in that game, he was very effective and he also saw a lot of usage. He had a 36% usage rate in those 18 minutes and he put up 27 fantasy points in those 18 minutes. And this was against Texas. So this is a team that's no slouch on the inside, you know, from interior defense. And now he gets a matchup against BYU, or I'm sorry, against West Virginia, where they're just a team that isn't really all that good and just kind of just hand out fantasy points like they're free candy. Um, and so if Fusaini Traore is going to continue to see his minutes increase and he's still going to play with that same usage level and, you know, he put up 1.5 fantasy points per minute against Texas. If, if he's able to do that again, he could very easily hit 30 plus fantasy points at a salary of only $4,800. He is their team usage leader on the season. And I do think that if he is back fully healthy, he is one of their best players. And so I do think um, Fusaini Traore has incredible upside here in this afternoon slate. All right, so let's go ahead and end the afternoon slate right there, and then let's go ahead and shift on over to the night slate. All right, so we're rolling on through into the night slate, which does have a few games that I think you can target here on this one. Um, you know, there's the Syracuse Wake Forest game that has a 149 point total. There's the Mississippi State Alabama game that has a total over 150, but the premier game of the night, which is probably the best game of the night, if not the best game of the day or, or game of the week for that matter, is Tennessee taking on Kentucky. Um, this one is projected to be 80 to 78 Tennessee, according to Ken Palm. That's a 158 point total, which is quite high. And there's a lot of different directions you can go in this game. 
Dalton Connect has just been great. Like, if you played him over the last two weeks, it's, he's probably just, like, printed money for you if you've gotten the last year on up, right? Um, and he's been outstanding. He said over 44 fantasy points in five of his last six games. And, you know, there's really no shine, no signs of stopping. Like, he's attempted 20 shots in each of those last five games. And if he's going to keep getting those shots, he's a good enough score that he's going to put him in the hoop and he's going to put up a lot of fantasy points. Continuing on the Tennessee side, Jonas Adu has also been pretty effective over the last five games. He's been over 30 fantasy points in four of the last five, and he's been over 44 fantasy points in, I'm sorry, over 40 fantasy points in two of the last five. And like we just saw Tyree Samuel of Florida absolutely go off against this Kentucky front course, and maybe Adu can do the same. And then, you know, you've also got other guys for Kentucky that like they're not like you know, super successful in fantasy as of late, but they're guys who have good pedigrees or good college basketball players like Zakai Ziegler, like Santiago Vescovi, like Josiah Jordan James. Like all those guys are going to play big minutes. They're all going to have the opportunity to hit some shots. Like I think in a game environment like this, you can definitely mix and match a lot of those guys because, you know, the the fancy the fancy performances might not be there as of late, but they're the proven good college basketball players who are going to have the ability to score points in a game that's going to feature a lot of points scored. Now, on the Tennessee side, the big question mark is whether or not DJ Wagner is going to play this game or not. If he sits, you're probably going to see usage very similar to what you saw earlier in the week against Florida. Reed Shepard uh, had a ceiling game in that game. He had 49 fantasy points. Um, he had um, was 10 for 18 from the field, put up 24, 8, and 6. And that's the ceiling that we like out of Reed Shepard. Like, he has the ability to absolutely fill up the stat sheet. You know, he, he barely plays over 25 minutes a game, and he averages over four boards and four assists like if he's going to be playing in the starting lineup he's a guy that needs to be in your DraftKings lineups like he like he did Wednesday night against Florida now after that you know Kentucky had four players who saw a 22 percent use rate or higher in that game and it was Reed Shepard it was Antonio Reeves it was Ugana Agneso and then it was also Rob Dillingham with Rob Dillingham the usage is never surprised it's just the minutes and so like DJ Wagner being out open up the door for him to play 39 minutes and put up 33 fantasy points if Wagner's going to continue to be out I will continue to roll with Shepard and um, Dillingham Agneso moved into the starting center role uh, two games ago against Arkansas and He's been really good. Like against Arkansas, he didn't do a whole lot, but against uh, Florida, he put up 54.5 fantasy points. A big reason was because he had eight blocks, but like even if you take those away, that's still 36 fantasy points. He was really good in that game. He was really effective, and um, I think they're going to continue to get a lot from him out of the, at the center position. The guy who kind of ended up left out, though, was Trey Mitchell. Um, you know, at the start of the season, he was playing the four, or I'm sorry, at the start of the season, he was playing the five, and now that they have Onyeso and Bradshaw and Big Z back, now Mitchell is playing more of the four, and it had been working for him in fantasy until Shepard and Dillingham started playing a lot of minutes because Shepard and Dillingham are going to eat into his boards and assists. And Trey Mitchell did not have a good game, you know, shooting. He was 2 for 10 from the field, 0 for 5 from behind the arc. You know, so could we see a bounce back game for Trey Mitchell? I think it's definitely a possibility. But based on what we saw last game, I would certainly be more inclined to play Shepard Dillingham or Agneso ahead of Trey Mitchell. And then Antonio Reeves, I, I, I barely mentioned him. He did have a pretty solid usage rate. He put up 30 fantasy points, just kind of does what he does, right? Like that's kind of what we expect out of Antonio Reeves at this point. Um, I don't really see the opportunity for him to have a ceiling game though against a Tennessee team that's still pretty good defensively. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about some guards. So at the guard spot, my high-priced option, let me get rid of the filter here. My high-priced option is going to be Judah Mintz of Syracuse. I mentioned that I like the Syracuse Wake Forest game, and he is a guy that I really like a lot in this game. He is back to being Syracuse's usage leader on a game-in, game-out basis. And what I really like is that he just has a variety of ways to put up fantasy points. Right, like against Boston College, eight for sixteen from the field, did it mostly scoring, put up thirty-one fantasy points, and that was with dealing with foul trouble. Uh, NC State, you know, he was three for nine from the field, but still put up forty-four fantasy points. Miami, three for eleven from the field, still put up forty-four fantasy points. Like he just has so many ways to get there in, in a game, you know, against Wake Forest where the tempo is going to be pushed. There's going to be a lot of points scored. I just think it's a great spot for Judah Mintz, and I think a lot of people are going to be playing Connect and Shepard. So um, I think you're going to see you know a little bit of an ownership squeeze on Judah Mintz as well as Mark Sears of Alabama who's also been great lately the other guys that I considered in this um, top tier price range I considered the Xavier guys Olivari and Claude simply because like DePaul like just 
hands out fantasy points. And, you know, the, those two, if they're able to play 30 plus minutes, they're probably going to score a boatload of fantasy points. Um, I also considered Augustus Mercy Alonis of St. Mary's, who has now taken over as their starting point guard. And um, he's played 40 minutes in each of the last two games, put up 38 fantasy points in each of those last two games as well. So um, definitely a guy that if he can continue what he's been doing, it's a pace up spot against Gonzaga. That's a really spot, a really good spot to play in it. Now, heading on down to the mid-tier, um, there is one guy that immediately intrigued me when I saw his name, and that was Josh Hubbard of Mississippi State. So on the surface, you can look back to his first game against Alabama and say that he only had 20.5 fancy points, but then you realize he was 3 for 11 from the field, so the usage was still there, the shots were still there, they just weren't falling, and if they do fall, then he could have a chance to have a big game, but also... He's seeing a little bit of a boost lately. He only played 21 minutes in that game against Alabama. Well, he's played 27 minutes or more in each of the last four games, and he actually moved into the starting lineup in the last two games against Auburn and Ole Miss. And in those two games against Auburn, he only put up 20 fantasy points. That's because he didn't do a whole lot else outside of scoring. But against Ole Miss, he really found the peripheral stats, put up 40 fantasy points. And so that upside is genuinely there with Hubbard. This is a guy who's going to take a ton of shots. And now that he's in the starting lineup playing a ton of minutes, I really feel more comfortable playing him. And as salary $6,700, the price is still right for him. Now, heading on down further, um, UCLA played Thursday night, and they were in a very interesting scenario where Sebastian Mack was back, but he, like, barely played. Dylan Andrews had a lot of success. He's at $5,900. I think you can go back to him. But the guy that I'm going to mention for my low-tier play is going to be Will McClendon of UCLA. So um, when it comes to Will McClendon, he was playing a lot of boosted minutes because of Sebastian Mack's injury. Um, you know, played 25 minutes against Arizona, 24 against USC. Um, but, you know, even with Mack back in the lineup against Oregon State, he still played 28 minutes. And he's been pretty good in the last two games for UCLA, putting up 16 and 21 fantasy points in those two games. Might not sound like a whole lot, but he's only $4,400. And this is a big time pace up spot against Oregon. Now heading to the forward position. You know, this is kind of the slate where the top tier forward options kind of dried up a little bit. You know, we had a whole lot for, you know, the day as a whole, but the night slates where they kind of started to run dry. You know, I already mentioned Adu and Mitchell, but like Isaac Jones of Washington State, he's a solid play, like if unspectacular. I don't think he has like an incredible amount of upside, but I think he's a solid play against Washington, a team who's given up a lot to centers this year. And then you have Nefali Dante and Tolu Smith, who have both returned from injury and displayed massive ceilings, but also pretty low floors as well. Um, so I think those two are in play for me as well. But my favorite high-priced forward option is going to be Jameer Watkins taking on Louisville. And we've seen this Louisville team get absolutely battered by forwards inside. And Watkins is a guy that the usage has been pretty darn consistent through the entire season. And he gets to his fantasy totals in a variety of ways. If he is to have a ceiling game, it's probably going to come on the heels of a double-double like he did against Syracuse when he had 27-11 and 11 and put up 49 fantasy points. Now, my mid-tier play is going to be a little bit outside of the box, and it's also just barely going to be on the border for me. It's going to be Michael Rattage of Oregon State taking on USC. So Michael Rattage has been really good lately. He had two games of 30 or more fantasy points prior to Thursday night against UCLA, and I'm willing to forgive him for only having 20 fantasy points against UCLA simply because UCLA tends to play rock fights, and that game was one. Um, but he's been in the starting lineup each of the last three games, and I think that if that continues, he's going to have a lot of opportunities to put up fantasy points and use it. USC has been very vulnerable to big men this season. So Michael Rataj is another guy that I'm going to be considering. Now, ironically enough, my low tier option at the forward spot is going to be another guy from the same exact game. And that is going to be Arrington Page of USC. I believe I passed him. There he is. Arrington Page of USC got the start in their last game against Oregon kind of out of nowhere. Like it was really surprising. Um, I guess they like what they had seen out of him off the bench earlier in the month. Um, but he got the start in that game, only played 19 minutes, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. But in those 19 minutes, he put up 18 fantasy points. Took six shots in those 19 minutes, so the usage was there. So I definitely think you can go back to Arrington Page at a salary of only $3,300. If he plays 19 minutes again, maybe you know even a little bit more, like 20 to 22, puts up 15 fantasy points, that's going to get the job done at only $3,300. So that's a guy I do think you have to consider for your lineups, and I really think DraftKings was sleeping on that price tag. All right, that does it for the Saturday night slate, and that does it for the marathon video for a marathon Saturday slate where we covered 
the main afternoon and night slate. If you want more from me, there's a lot of guys that are on these slates that I was not able to mention in this video. If you want more from me, follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. Join the Fantasy Corner Discord. It's entirely free. There's a lot of smart people in there who play a lot of DFS for a lot of different sports. The college basketball chat has been popping lately. We've had a blast in there the last few days, and we've had a lot of guys come close to some GPP wins in there. But basically, I'm going to be in there all day with a lot of other guys just bouncing ideas off each other, talking lineups, talking strategy. Um, injury news, we're also, we also got a lot of guys who specialize in getting those out to us. So it's just a great place to be if you're looking for a community to be a part of with DFS. If you're looking for more people to talk DFS with, join the Fantasy Corner Discord. It's entirely free. You have nothing to lose. And it's a blast. Also, I do write a full article on my Patreon for every college basketball slate. Um, I highlight all of my core plays as well as my lineup strategy and attack strategy for the slate. There's not a whole lot of people out there doing this for college basketball, so I do think I provide some pretty good information that can help you win in college basketball DFS, so check that out if you are interested. Now, that does it for this episode, y'all. So um, hopefully I was able to give you guys some good information on this episode that's going to help you make money all Saturday long for all three of these slates. Um, best of luck to you on the Saturday slate. If you like what you saw in this video, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel as well. And also let me know what you think of the format because I'm trying to figure out the best way to do the Saturday show because what it always ends up being is it always ends up being kind of a time crunch as well as kind of a drag because of how much content there is to get to. So I'm trying to come up with ways that we can best do the Saturday show to help you guys out. Um, and I think that by doing all three sites, I hope that we're able to do that here on this episode. So that does it for this episode. Best of luck to you guys on all three of the Saturday slates. Thank you guys for watching and listening to this point, and I will see you next time.